without the involvement of, uh, of somebody on your team moderating. So today we're going to focus more on moderated usability tests. And specifically, we're going to talk about remote moderated tests, because that's what you're going to be doing for your assignment. So you're going to be involved in the test, but you're not going to be in person necessarily with the, with the person who's taking the test. So let's uh, start with a quick little recap. So why is usability testing important at a high level? Who knows? At a very high level, <laughs> yeah, very high. Testing, um, is just to make sure that your product is usable. Yeah, just make sure that your product is usable and intuitive and that the, the user is able to complete the tasks uh, in an efficient manner. Yeah. Thanks, Rina. You say it better than I do. Oh, <laughs> you, you said it more succinctly. Um, I was just building off of your, your definition. So, uh, what are the benefits of moderated usability testing, meaning that you have somebody present from your team during the test? It helps get uh, <clears throat> like second set of eyes. Uh, yeah. Maybe you miss something that the other person did. It. Right, definitely. So uh, you can you can be there to guide if need be. You don't want you don't want to influence the test too much. Uh, but if the users miss on if the the testee is misunderstanding one of the prompts or something about the test, then you have another set of eyes there uh, to let them to get them pointed in the right direction. So we're not get, we're not going to help them uh, navigate the interface, but we are able to help them navigate the test itself if they've misunderstood something about the format. Anything else? What do we get to do if uh, you know if they if they say something that's interesting or if they're puzzled about something? What can we do if we're present during the test? We can definitely get some more insights on uh, what they may think or even suggestions that they might have to offer. Yeah, so that could so be good ask them to elaborate, right? So whereas in a in an unmoderated test, maybe they just maybe they think something but don't say it. And then we miss. We don't get the chance to then uh, stop them and ask them what they're thinking. So it gives us the ability to interject uh, in real time while they're taking the test, and then also to ask follow-up questions. So if they do something interesting, we can say, "So what? So why did you do that? Or what was going through your head?" Whereas we, you don't get that opportunity if they're just if they're just running through a script on their own time and you're not present. Cool. Um, so let's talk really quickly about just the general overview for usability testing. Uh, so there's this organization called 18F. I don't know if any of you ever heard of them, but uh, 18F is actually pretty cool. I'll show you their website. So 18F is sort of like a like a digital services startup within the government. So they they use lean startup methodologies and design thinking. A lot of the stuff we talk about in class. Uh, and apply them to government agencies, like to help them create better experiences on their websites and with other technical products. So it's pretty cool. Like they uh, they operate as a startup. They hire a lot of people from from who have worked at, at uh, prominent tech companies to try to operate to try to make uh, the government's digital services operate a little bit more like a startup rather than a big uh, bureaucratic machine. So uh, 18F is is a pretty good authority also on a uh, on things like user experience and research best practices. So they define these as the five high level steps uh, in, in setting up and running a usability test. So first, obviously you need to choose what you wanna test. And then you wanna uh, plan for your research. So what's gonna be the format of your test? Um, who's gonna be present? Uh, what will their roles be? What's the timeline? So all of this planning that surrounds all the decisions that surround the the way that you're going to test what you choose to test. And then, then you're going to recruit users. So finding the right people is really important because if you're testing with people who aren't representative of your users, then you might not, uh, then you might not get useful information. And informing their consent, which is making sure that they know what they're getting into in terms of how the data will be used, um, uh, what kind of privacy they'll have, who's going to be accessing uh, the test results. 
uh, that's best practices. Then actually what goes into running the session and then best practices around discussing and sharing the results of your findings to make it useful for your team. So that's the, the high level overview. And we're gonna go through this uh, really quickly step-by-step step now, uh, just to talk through some of the key points. But any questions on the high level process or order? All right, let's get into the details. So the first step we talked about is choosing what to test. So uh, when you're choosing what to test with your product, you want to consider what kinds of, of tests would provide the highest value to your company. And you want to start with the highest value tasks first. So this can vary a lot based on um, how early you are in the product life cycle. Uh, maybe if you're earlier in the product life cycle, it makes sense to do more of a uh, you know, we talked about five second tests. Maybe it makes sense to do more of a five second test to make sure that the person can understand what the product is. Um, whereas if you're a little bit later and you and you have higher fidelity and maybe you're thinking about um, which styles or brand elements evoke what you want the website to evoke, then maybe you want to do a preference test. So that where you are in the product life cycle can affect what type of test you choose or what, or what you choose to test, whether it's your brand or whether it's the workflows. Um, and then also obviously what, what kind of product you have and what the core workflows are. So the highest value options usually include things like the core user flow. So what are people primarily trying to accomplish with your product? Um, maybe maybe the, the first big step is to get them to just sign up. So you want to test the sign up flow. Um, what are some pages or experiences within your product uh, that are key to, to the customer success while using it and to the business success? So these are all the things you want to think about when you're deciding what are the highest value features to test um, and, uh, and how you want to test them. All right. Uh, so the next step is planning for the research. So once you've decided what you want to test, you need to decide how you want to test. So um, you want to, one of the first things you need to decide is the timeline. So this is ver a very internal thing. You want to coordinate with the other stakeholders for the project and other team members uh, to figure out what an appropriate timeline is for your research projects. So you might not want to get way ahead of, uh, of say, um, say the engineering timeline because the product might not might uh, be changing a lot between uh, when you do the testing and when the feature is released. So you want to make sure that you coordinate with everybody who is involved uh, in the product or in the project. And you want to define the roles. So the primary roles for most research studies are the moderator and the observer. So if you're lucky enough to work at a company that has the resources for both, uh, you can have one person who's moderating, who's running the discussion, asking the questions, and then another person who's just focused on observing and taking notes so that the moderator can just focus on the conversation. Uh, if you're at a smaller company, those might be the same person. Uh, maybe, you're, maybe you're moderating and then you're also recording so you don't need to take as many notes. So next up, you want to prepare your prototype and your script. And usually you do these things in tandem because uh, your, your prototype is meant to test out the tasks that you have in your script. And you want to make sure that the prototype, uh, in the prototype, it's possible to complete all of the tasks. So it's good to do those two things hand in hand to make sure that they line up well. And the script has a few different parts to it. And we're going to take a look at a quick sample script that actually comes from 18F, the startup that I was talking about. Uh, I think we're getting some audio feedback. Somebody. Uh, OK, cool. I think we're good. OK, so let's take a quick look at a usability test script. Is this it's big enough for everyone to see? So first, uh, any usability test script uh, should start with an introduction. And I know this can, it can feel a little bit formal uh, at the beginning of an interview because maybe you want to just start out by having a little bit of casual conversation. And that's fine if you want to just open it up with, like, some, with some pleasantries. But it's good to have uh, a standardized introduction so that you can make sure that you don't miss out on any of the, any of the key points that you need to hit on before the test. So we're going to start out by introducing ourselves. I'm the moderator, um, and uh, and tell them about like the broad purpose of the of the company or product that you're working on. 
you want to thank them, let them know that their feedback is valuable. Uh, it's people, people like to know that they're contributing to something larger. Uh, makes us feel important. Uh, then you, you wanted some of the good idea would be to highlight the, the length of the session and confirm that, that amount of time still works. It's really common in my experience to, to schedule an interview with somebody uh, and, and then you call them and they're like, yeah, I actually only have 15 minutes. Uh, when really the test is going to take kind of half an hour. So a lot of time, then you need to reschedule. And let, let them know like uh, basic, uh, basic comforts, like uh, if they need to take a break or stop at any time, let them know. Maybe there's a planned break so that they can use the, the restroom or do whatever they need to do. Uh, so if, if that's the case, let them know. So this is just all about setting expectations. And you want to let them know just the basic format of the test. So this, was, this may just be confirming something they already know, but you want to let them know that they're just going to be sharing their screen and accomplishing a few tasks using the website that, that they're evaluating. So this is for a, re a remote session. So they're going to be control co sharing their screen and controlling it on their computer. One really important thing to note is that there are no wrong answers. So a lot of the time, people come into these tests with an anxiety that they're the ones being tested and that they're going to feel kind of dumb if they're not able to complete the flow. So a really good thing to emphasize is that we're not testing them. We're testing the website. So if, if they're not able to complete the tasks, it's not their fault. It's the website's fault. And that's actually exactly what we want to find out so that we can improve it and make it easier to complete the tasks. Letting them know that they're not going to hurt our feelings if they, if they, if they give us harsh feedback. That's actually what we're looking for. We want their honest reactions. And then it's important to, to let them know, um, to ask them for permission to record the call and explain why uh, you're going to be recording the call. And uh, one, of the, one of the main things that I usually touch on when I'm doing this is let them know, like, I'm really just recording this call so that I can focus on our conversation and don't have to take notes and let them know that the only people accessing this recording will be internal on our team just to improve the website. We won't be sharing it with anybody else. So I know that was a, a little bit long-winded. There, there are a lot of different parts to touch on here in the intro, and that's why it's really important to have this script for the intro. Even if you start out with some casual conversation, you want to have the script just to make sure you don't miss out on any of this important information that's going to prepare them to take the test and let them know um, kind of what they're, uh, what they're getting themselves into. Any questions on the intro? And this doesn't have to be super creative or anything. It's very boilerplate, very standardized. Um, you can pretty much just copy and paste this introduction for anything and just insert, uh, insert the details about yourself and the company. So next, a uh, quick warm up. So, uh, before you before you dive right into asking them questions about the product, you want to just set them at ease and also get some personal background into them. So understanding a little bit about who they are and where they're coming from. You can ask them about their work. You can ask them about their, their hobbies, how they spend their time. Um, and you can ask them about their goals in their work or what motivates them. So this is just sort of painting a larger picture of where they're coming from uh, and also serving this, the, the dual purpose of kind of like setting them at ease and getting them. Uh, getting them in the right mindset to start thinking through these tasks. Then uh, at that point, you want to actually get ready to administer the test. So you want to set up the screen sharing if that hasn't done beforehand, if that hasn't been done beforehand. So if you're remote, you're going to you're going to explain to them how they can uh, how they can start screen sharing using whatever tool you're using. So if we're using Zoom, which I've used a lot for for user testing. Uh, it's a constant battle to try to help the user find that little green box with the arrow coming out of it, uh, which, uh, depending on what computer, what type of computer you're on, can be in many different places, apparently. <laughs> so getting them to start the screen share. And then you want to get into the actual tasks. So uh, typically, you want to do, ask them to do two or three tasks. Uh, and you want to make sure that they're not too specific, but not too general. And we talked about some of these questions yesterday. So general enough to, to give them the flexibility to accomplish it in multiple ways, but also specific enough uh, that, that, that every, every user is looking for the same thing and we're not asking them 
something uh, that's kind of based on their opinion or preferences, unless that's what we're trying to test. And I'm not going to get into this example here because it's it's kind of confusing and very specific to this uh, to this government website. Uh, but we'll talk more about tasks a little bit later on. But this is this is really the meat of the test here. And then after that, uh, after you've gone through the ta the tasks, then you want to ask any follow up questions. So if you've jotted down any notes on interesting things that came up, any points of friction, this is a really good time. Uh, to, to circle back to those and ask them to elaborate. So here it says, you mentioned blank earlier and I didn't want to jump in at that time. Can you say more about that? So this is if, you, if they were in a flow, you didn't want to interrupt it, but there was something interesting you wanted to touch on. Then after that, uh, wrap it up. Uh, let them know how much you appreciate their time. They're doing the company a really big favor. Uh, and then ask if they have any follow-up questions or, or general thoughts about the product or experience. And then uh, it's a good idea to also ask if they know anybody else that you should talk to. So it's a, a good way of, of expanding your network of, of testers if they know somebody who they think would be uh, in the target audience of the product. All right, no, that was a lot. <laughs> does, uh, does anybody have any questions on this script? And let me preface this with, so for, for your assignment, you're gonna be running usability tests today and we'll get into the specifics of that but you're gonna be repurposing this script just by adding the, adding the information about, the, about uh, it's gonna be Newsy for today's assignment, uh, and then adding your tasks here. And when you actually administer this test, you're gonna be reading through uh, your version of this script. So I'll, I'll be sharing this in Slack as well so that you can use it as a template. Anything jump out to anybody, anything, Anything seem uh, like it's missing? Anything seem maybe unnecessary? All right, so let's keep going then. So we're on uh, we're on phase three here. So just to to go back, we've been through choosing what to test, planning for your research, and now we're going to talk about recruiting users and informing their consent. So. Once you've coordinated and planned your research, the next step is to recruit. So there are several different ways to recruit participants. Um, you could be recruiting them from friends and family, through social media, uh, through a service like usertesting.com that has a big database of user testers that are gonna be broken down by demographic audience. Um, you, could be, um, you could be setting up an advertising campaign on Facebook that's targeted at specific demographics, uh, offering uh, you know, offering, offering compensation in exchange for the test. So there are lots of different ways to recruit participants, but you ideally always want to start with a screener. So you might have heard of a screener. You might have taken screeners if you've ever done research studies. But a screener is just a short questionnaire that will ensure that you're recruiting the right users. So it should ask a set of questions that make sure the user's in your target audience and willing and able to complete the study. Um, so you could ask things about, uh, you know, how old they are, uh, what their employment status is, any relevant questions uh, that, that make sure that they're in your target audience, and then also whether they're capable. So uh, if there's some physical element to the test for some reason, um, if they need to be available at a certain time, um, you can ask those logistical questions to make sure that they're going to be able to actually execute the study. And then another thing you can do, it, you should do at this step during the screener uh, is inform their consent. So we talked a little bit about this, but that basically means giving them any details about, uh, about the, um, how the test results will be used and ensuring the privacy of their personal data, just so before they agree to participate in the study, they have an understanding of, uh, of what they're going to be putting in and how the information is going to be used. Right, any questions about screeners? This is a, a very general example here with just a few questions, but screeners can be very varied based on who you're looking to recruit. And I just also wanted to remind everyone that I do have Slido open, and I don't, I don't show it on my screen, but I have it off to the side here, so if you ever if you ever want to jump in with a question that you think of, um, or or if you want to ask something anonymously, although no questions are dumb questions, so don't don't be shy. 
uh, feel free to, to drop that in Slido as well. OK, so um, after you find the participants that meet the criteria for your study, then you want to set up, send out an additional email to, uh, to confirm that they're interested in the study and also schedule a time for them to actually take it. So this is a, a recruitment <coughs> email template from 18F. Uh, it starts out, uh, this is going to be something that you send to a user who's already passed your screener. So you're going to introduce yourself, uh, reiterate the, the company that you're working for, uh, and what you're looking to what you're looking to do, uh, we're looking to incorporate feedback your feedback into our design process, uh, confirm their interest, and then uh, ask about logistical uh, details like when they would be available. Uh, let them know the length of the test, uh, and then just let them know the basic format. So you'll share your screen and accomplish some tasks using a design concept. And then you want to give them some resource for scheduling with you, like Calendly or some scheduling tool. And it's a good idea at this point also um, to, to give them opt-out instructions. So in the PS here, it says if you don't want to participate in this test, ignore the email. If you don't want to be contacted for future tests, please reply requesting to be removed. So giving them, it's nice to give people, uh, to let people know that there is a, uh, there's an opt-out if they're interested. So that's not only, not only a good thing to do, but also a way of generating goodwill and making them feel like they're not being uh, they're not being spammed or, or targeted without their consent. And so this is sort of what I just went through. I just wanted to put together a little outline of the different elements of this email template, which I'll come back to in a second, uh, because our in-class challenge is going to be uh, taking the next 15 minutes to write and customize your own recruitment email template for your chosen project for Build Week. So this is something that where you'll, you'll actually be able to uh, to use this going forward when you do your uh, usability testing for your own project. So I'll, I'll put this, uh, or, uh, sorry. I'll post these screenshots in Slack. Just so that you have access to them during this exercise. Hi, uh, so I'm actually having issues uh, viewing any kind of images in Slack. Uh, would you be able to like put it in a Google Doc and, and post that? Because I can like still see things in the Google Docs stuff, but for some reason the Slack images don't uh, like download. Okay, let me do this. Uh, Kyla, would you mind if I sent you these images and you drop them in a Google Doc? I also just put them in Slack. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I grab them. Thanks so much. Thank you. Cool. And then uh, you'll see there's also there's also a link here, which I will post. So this is an article that you can use for inspiration uh, about best practices for for writing effective recruitment emails. One of the one of the key uh, takeaways from this article, in my opinion, was uh, let the let the user know. Uh, what they're going to be getting out of it and make it feel like you're giving them an opportunity to be involved in the product development process rather rather than just asking them for a favor. And in my uh, in my experience, a lot of the testing I've done, uh, the users who are uh, the users who do it are really who opt in are usually pretty excited about feeling like they're kind of part of the design process. Uh, a lot of the time, these are the early adopters who are really excited about the product in general and love being able to give input, especially if that ends up having results for their businesses. So check out that article um, and try not to, to directly copy this recruitment email template, you know, make it your own um, and make it relevant to the company that, that you're, uh, they're the project that you're gonna be working on. Any questions before we get started? Oh, I see. Somebody put something in Slido. What kind of other questions can be in a screener? Um, so let's see if we can just find a comprehensive list. All right, let's look at SurveyMonkey.
So, okay, so we've got behavioral questions, uh, which, uh, which de obviously de determine what, whether people fit the behavioral profile of somebody you're looking for. So if you're looking to test uh, the, uh, oh, what's the name of the movie site, the movie booking site example that we use? Starts with an A. Anchor. Anchor, thank you, sorry. We used to call it something else. Uh, so if you're testing Anchor, you want to make sure that the people you're testing with actually go to the movies. So that would be a behavior question. Like, how many times have you been to the movies in the last six months? And if it's zero, then maybe they're not your ideal tester. Industry-specific ones, uh, filter out ones who might be biased. That's interesting. Um, so I guess maybe if you're, if you or testing a dental product, uh, maybe maybe testing a dentist. Maybe a dentist could be biased because they're already using other tools, or, or they might be within your target audience if, you, if the tool is for dentists. Uh, but basically, at a high level, these are these are questions. Once you've once you've determined what your demographic audience is, you want to start from there. Uh, and then work backwards and, and find out what questions you can ask to determine whether a given person falls into it. So if you're looking for, um, you know, young working, uh, young working women um, who go to the movies, you can ask them, you can ask them uh, questions that establish like whether they fit into that demographic and then behavioral questions about whether they go to the movies. All right, hopefully that provided a little more detail. So let's get into this exercise now. So I'm gonna start a 15 minute timer here and all the resources you need should be posted in Slack in the screenshots and looks like uh, Kyla uh, generously posted a Google doc there as well. Thanks Kyla. And begin.
Okay, got about one minute left. So if you haven't yet, start wrapping up your email. All right, time is up. Cool. So who wants to take the opportunity to, to get feedback on their email? I'll go. It's not a big deal. All right. Sounds good, Vivian. And so Vivian is, is going to be the tester. Who wants to volunteer to be the recipient of the email? I'll do it. All right. Hey, Christina. Hi. All right. Cool. So, uh, Vivian, do you want do you want to share your screen? Sure thing. All right. Let me Thanks just close my, my inappropriate tabs here. Oh, yep, yep. <laughs> anything? This will all be recorded. So, <laughs> close anything you don't want in the Lambda School recording. I actually might have something. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Cool. So let's let's pretend that Christina is going to be. Uh, you're going to be the recipient of this email. Alrighty. Oh. I'm going to get their reaction on it. I just need to be uh, precise here. Hold on. Am I reading yeah. it out loud? Great. Or is she reading it? Or how are we doing? Why this? don't we have uh, Christina? Do you want, do you want to read it as if you're you're receiving it? We do want her to read it so we can hear her beautiful voice. Yeah, let's do that. I think she's stuck though. Oh, are, are you? I hope you're not actually frozen. I, I think she just dropped it. <laughs> yeah, she just had a connection issue because she was stuck for a while. <laughs> Ignore. We were talking about uh, Machine Gun Kelly, if y'all could see. <laughs> well, we might need we might need to substitute Christina. She always be stealing my time slots, so I'll take her place. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Let's switch Christina to Serena. Hopefully, hopefully, Christina will be able to join us. All right. Hello, Serena. <laughs> On December 15th, 2019, my team will be conducting usability testing so that we can better understand how to structure the information within the Labor Lifetime, Lifeline app. The app will connect potential employers to the profiles of prisoners in order to select workers with the skills uh, the employer needs. This test can be completed via screen sharing and will be available to offer any assistance you might need with setup. The test will take about 45 minutes of your time and we will be offering a $20 Amazon gift card as a thank you for your help. I will um, <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. That's right, thank you, Vivian. <laughs> There are several time slots available, unlike our cohort. Please view the schedule and indicate which time slot mo is most convenient uh, for you by visiting, by visiting in, okay, and select your preference. The first 10 responders will be chosen. Thank you so much for your consideration and we will look forward to hearing or receiving valuable feedback. Boom. Ooh, I like that there's an unsubscribe link at the bottom. That's a nice 
So what do you think, Serena? Were you, are you interested in doing this study? Um, am I, am I a prisoner currently? Uh, I don't know. Are you? Am I? I don't know. <laughs> You're an employer, right? <laughs> I'm a employer. Okay. Okay. Cool. 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 Let's say that we'll say that you're an employer who's who's attempting to uh, utilize the application to connect with the the database of potential workers. Okay. So, Serena, do you feel like you have a good idea of what the what the company does? I do. I do. I just wasn't sure what my role was in this case. And do you okay. feel like uh, do you feel like you have background for this? Do you know why you're getting this email? No, so that was that was actually going to be my uh, follow up was um, where would you have found that I am interested in this program? Yeah, so I think I think that would probably be a good thing to touch off right at the, right at the beginning is why are you receiving this email? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see. So what else? So uh, do you feel like you have a good understanding of of what the what they're asking of you? It's a little bit vague as to exactly what tests, but I, it's clear that it's going to take about 45 minutes mm -hmm. and that we will doing it remote. We will be doing it remotely. Oh, um, you understand the, the format of the test. Yes. Yes. I think that's the important part. Uh, okay. because, and in, in this case, uh, Vivian probably doesn't want to tell you what, what you'll be testing just because uh, she doesn't want to um, she doesn't want to plant plant any biases or have you start thinking ahead about this. It's meant to be mm. sort of a spontaneous experience. Cool, makes sense. So I, think, I think we did, did a really good job there of explaining the format of the test without giving away too much of what you'd be doing. Cool. Okay. And yeah. let's see. So you have so you understand the format of the test. You understand the company. Uh, one thing that maybe could have been clarified was uh, was why you're receiving this email. I think that's a really good thing to start with. Um, are you clear on what you'll be getting out of this? Oh yeah, yeah. Twenty dollar gift card. Yeah. Uh, other than other than that, um, do you feel? Is there anything else you feel like you'll be getting out of it? Mm, no. No. Okay. Okay. So maybe uh, one thing that one thing that they talked about in that medium article was uh, making the making the tester feel like they're uh, really contributing to the development of this product. Uh, and if, if that person is actually a user, then uh, then it's even easier to make that connection because you, you can more than incorporate this feedback to make the product work better for you. Cool. cool. So, so as well as just the monetary incentive, it can be good to, to make them feel like they're, uh, you know, they're a part of the team and they're contributing. And that, that can actually be more powerful for some people. Mm -hmm. I just want my gift card, so I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, just, I'm honing in on my empathy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Um, let's. And anybody have any other thoughts on this? I think it's my threatening profile photo. Nobody wants to speak up. <laughs> Kat, Catherine says the Amazon gift card strikes again. Yes. 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 But maybe, maybe that Amazon gift card will will be enough to get them to overcome the threatening photo. <laughs> All right. Well, if anybody saw any swear words in my Slack, you know, my bad. That's those are the risks of screen sharing. Yeah, I was like, oh, man. Uh, I wasn't talking about anybody because I love everybody <laughs> here. <laughs> Major risks. I'm always reviewing my tabs before I screen share. <laughs> so, what do you guys think of that line at the end? The first ten respondents will be chosen, or how did, how does that make you feel, Serena? Um, that puts some pressure on me. Yeah, I don't know. Did yeah, you, that make you feel like, oh, this is like an exclusive thing I'm being invited to. No, I felt like I, I'm like FOMO. I might be missing out, or that I already probably missed out. Okay. And, so, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because I'm a bad email reader. So it made you feel one of two, one of two things, either. Or they're like, this is something I want to be a part of. I don't want to miss out on. Or I probably already missed out if I saw the email. Tonight. Yeah. So Actually, the honestly, I would have probably not even responded to the email because I'd be like, oh, yeah, that was two days ago. Yeah, no. They yeah. probably already got their 10 candidates. So that's a really interesting consideration. So it's it could, it could uh, either help or hurt 
to the case for the for the interviewer. Yeah, but that's just me personally. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, th yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Vivian and uh, and Serena, for going through this with us. Absolutely. Thanks. Of course. All right. Um, so it's nine fifty-five. So let's take a quick five-minute break, and uh, and I'll see you all back here in five minutes. Uh, let me just bring up the timer. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions on those uh, on those emails? Any challenges that anybody wants to bring up? Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I was a little bit unsure how to like word the like scheduling part of it because I don't know how I'm gonna do that yet um I think that was the biggest thing I was just like I don't know yeah. um, I, think I, I ended up just being like uh oh, there's a list of like available dates and times like available below choose one that works for you and yeah. like and then send me an email with your response uh but yeah, I think that like figuring out like how to communicate the logistics when you like don't yet know what those logistics are. Right. I think I think that's a good approach. I think that it's generally about striking the balance between uh, making sure that you, there are times when the people from your team are going to be available and making sure that there are enough times and enough flexibility that you can work with their schedule. So actually one, one thing that, that uh, I noticed on, that we didn't touch on on the email that we were just reviewing together was there was just one specific date given. So in order to be able to, uh, to uh, accommodate the, the test subject candidates, it might be a good idea to offer a little more flexibility or even say, we're testing on this date, but uh, we can also set up other ones and work with your schedule. So I think also offering a, an other option, like if none of these work for you, we can work with you to find another time 
if that's possible within your constraints is a good idea. Um, using tools like Calendly is really good to, to automate the scheduling so they can select slots through that and it automatically populate on your calendar. Uh, but I think since you haven't set up any of those tools yet, your approach was really good of like here, here are some dates and times that were available and then maybe follow up with let us know if none of those work for you and we'll see if we can work something out. Cool. All right, shall we move on? So actually really quickly backing up, zooming out, usability testing overview. So, so far we've gone through choosing what to test, planning for research, recruiting users and informing their consent. And now we're gonna talk about the last two, first of which is actually running the session. So what does test day look like? So uh, on test day, um, there are going to be a lot of logistics. So you wanna make sure that uh, the screen sharing software that they'll need is downloaded on their computers uh, and prepared ahead of time, maybe asking them to, to test it out in advance to make sure that it works, familiarize themselves, because a lot of the time you're gonna be running on a tight deadline but it is a good idea to, to build in at least 10 minutes at the beginning to work through any kinks. Um, I've had a lot of 30 minute user testing calls where the first 15 minutes were spent with them trying to uh, you know, get the right version of Chrome downloaded so they could get Zoom set up and then, and then trying to help them navigate and uh, find their, the share button on their old PC. Uh, so it's good to build in time to do that or ask them to prepare up front especially if you're working with, uh, with an audience that's less technically adept. Can um, you send a, a second email to the participants that are already set up a date saying, hey, before, hey, please download this. Oh, sorry, we're, we're getting some interesting music uh, from your audio, and it's a little hard to hear you. <laughs> uh, could you send a second email? Uh, to the people that already set up a time, uh, saying something like, uh, if you could please download a Zoom and all this so everything could go smooth. Yeah, I think that would be a really good thing to put in your confirmation email once once they've scheduled an event. You can even automate that. Uh, that's a really good idea, just to uh, let them know what they can do to get ready for the session. Yeah, so that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, although you'll, you'll probably also need to follow up the day of and make sure that they're make sure that they're all set because a lot of people will just not do that in advance. So having a backup plan is good. And then also having a backup method for conducting the study if the screen share doesn't work. So sometimes it just doesn't work. And so uh, having a backup could be as simple as uh, giving a phone number for them to call, like if the Zoom or video conference thing doesn't work. Uh, and then giving them, uh, and then making sure that they have uh, a phone or something that they can use, uh, or that you have some way uh, of recording the phone call as well, whether that's using your phone or some sort of uh, call recording program that you can use after getting their consent to do that. So day of is just uh, making sure that you're ready for it, for any uh, any logistical uh, issues that might come up, making sure that you're all set up, and then actually just running through the script. And then after, you, after you've run the sessions, the next step is to discuss and share your results. So uh, once you have all of this raw data, you need to put it into a form that's actually useful for your team. So as you're going through all those res results, as you're listening to all those recorded interviews, you wanna take notes, write down timestamps, pull out interesting comments. Uh, you're gonna be looking for patterns. Uh, you're pulling out uh, quantitative data on task completion rates. So what percentage of the users were able to complete which task successfully, uh, what were some of the common sticking points, um, and then looking for any new answers to questions that you posed for your research study uh, and anything else that you saw that, that stood out as interesting. So keeping in mind the goal that, that you uh, defined before you started your usability test, uh, you want to make sure that you answer that goal and then that you show your result, you share your results with stakeholders in a way that's really easy to digest so that they can easily get the takeaways from your report. And then always conclude your research with next steps. So based on your findings, uh, what, are, what are your design recommendations? Uh, and then what additional research might you wanna conduct uh, for any results that were inconclusive or unclear? or any new and interesting questions that came up that you might want to explore. So let's take a look at uh, the results 
of a, of a sample usability report. So this one is, is pretty graphical and, and pretty detailed. Uh, but you'll see it has, has the roles of the people who were involved here, has the table of contents, so executive summary, goals, methodology. So the executive summary, these are the key takeaways. Uh, it's called the executive summary because it's meant for a busy executive to be able to quickly read and understand the strategic implications. So 72% were able to complete all tasks, 28% were unable to complete, 54% enjoyed the specific experience, 68% had difficulty. And then here on the left, you can list some of the, um, uh, list the, the details of the test. So what factors are you using to define usability? And then list some of your key findings, such as the majority of participants understood the general premise of the product. Reiterate the goals of the test, the methodology, so what methods were used for administering the test, and maybe doing a, a breakdown of the, of the demographic audience, the, the people who actually tested it. And you'll see that um, some of these some of these can come from the the answers to the screener questions. So these could be either things that you asked during the test or in the screener before the test. And highlighting the details of the introduction and the task post test questions. So this is really good to have here, uh, just so that they can understand the con the full context of the test. And then the results. Um, so pulling out key findings, good and the bad, for each of the different tasks. Any bugs or issues that came up with the test to be aware of that might have affected the results, like uh, maybe something wasn't working correctly in the prototype. And then most importantly, your recommendations and action items based on the findings. And make sure that these aren't your aren't just opinions, but make sure that they're rooted in uh, the uh, the hard findings of the study. Anybody have any questions about um, usability reports? There are obviously a lot of different ways to do this. This is this is a pretty thorough template. Yeah, I was just gonna say I love the template. That's yeah. You know, you're able to plug in what you need, especially getting started, you know, right now, um, being able to see visually what it is that we might um, might need to, you know, um, have the data on. It's right. Really yeah, definitely. I think I think this is really well put together. Cool. And so this doesn't, like there are templates out there, so you don't need to be a, a great infographic designer and able to do this. You could use something like this uh, to create your own. Or if you do have a visual designer on your team, maybe you could ask them to put together some graphics that would help, uh, that would help uh, really emphasize some of the findings. Cool. So what we're going to do now is I'm actually going to administer a usability test to somebody in the class uh, live so that everybody can see how that could go. So I'm not going to be running through a whole long script. I'm actually just going to kind of uh, skip ahead to the part where I'm explaining the, where I'm giving context into the exercise and doing the tasks. So does, does anybody want to volunteer to, uh, to do this usability test with me? It's just a pretty quick one task test. Yeah, I'll do it. Oh. You can go, JP. <laughs> All right, JP. Yeah, we're stepping up. Okay, so actually, I'm not going to show this to you yet. Okay, so here's the here's the quick context, JP. So you decide to explore, and I'm just reading through a script here. So uh, you decide to explore the website for a clothing brand, and you land on on this page. So, what was that? Okay, so you decide to explore the website for a clothing brand and you're and you land on this page, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, to give you some context into the format of this test, uh, you'll be using a prototype that's not completely finished yet. Uh, so you can interact with it just like you would any other website. Uh, if something doesn't work, I would really appreciate if you could explain uh, what you would expect to happen and move on. So since not everything hooked up, you might click on something that doesn't do anything. If that happens, uh, just let me know what you expect it to happen. Just think out loud. Uh, right. Do you understand the limitations of the prototype? Correct, yes. Yes, all right, great. Um, so, um, so for the first task, I'm going to show you this prototype. And uh, just to keep things simple, I will. Uh, I'll just. I'll just click for you, uh, and you can just tell me where you want to click. Okay. So okay. for the first task, uh, take as much time as you need to create an account. Uh, stop when you arrive on the account created successfully screen. Mm -hmm. uh, you will also not be able to type in this prototype, so you'll just tap on text fields instead of typing in them. Okay. So uh, take as much time as you need to create an account and stop when you arrive on the account created successfully screen. What should we, what would you do? Okay, first well, what I would do is click the sign in. And then I would like to create an account at the bottom where it says no account yet underneath. Okay. And then um, in the form field in my first name, I would put JP. Okay. Sorry, your name yeah, is last Glenn. Time. Well, it's Glenn now. Yeah. Uh, then <laughs> email address and then password. Uh, first, I would like to see if it would show the password. Is that a thing? Okay. Uh, looks like okay. that's not connected in this prototype. But uh, but what what made you what made you interested in that or what? The you... reason why I wanted to see um, to show my password is to see if I if my password what I wrote was correct. Okay. Great. Yeah, and then let's create the account and uh, go back to shop. Okay. And, and so what was the intention there? Uh, to create an account for, for LW. Okay. And clicking back to shop, what did you expect to happen? I expected to go back to the front page of, of the site or the application. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, so the, the, the task is now complete. So I'm just going to ask you a few follow-up questions about your experience. Of course. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, how would you finish this sentence? Overall, this task was blank. Simple. Oh, and can you explain your answer? Uh, the reason why I say it's simple is because, um, it's easy to, to create an account, but Otherwise, I mean, let's see. The reason why it was simple, it was it was just really flowing. But although it was hard to understand from the front page to either sign in or sign up. Mm. Because yeah. it didn't really say anything. Because um, usually I would sign up, you know. I feel like sign in has like a sign up like button. Okay, so so it sounds like it was uh, one of the um, one thing that was confusing was that there was no sign up button on the homepage. It was sign in. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, got it. Cool. Um, so, how confident are you on a scale of one to seven? Seven being the most confident that you completed the task. Um, at a scale of one through ten or seven. One through seven. Um, I would say like seven. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So very <laughs> So, um, what if anything was easy about the task? Was anything easy? Yeah. Anything specific that was really easy or or intuitive about the task? Let's see. Um, I think just completing the form field and being able to just create that account and being go, and you know letting you know that your account is created. I guess that was easy. Okay, but... so the feedback that you got here. Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, cool. And did you feel like anything was missing? Uh, I mean, for the first time trying it, I wouldn't say uh, 
there's anything missing at the point, but the only thing I would say that was missing is functionality of being able to show your password if you mistype something. Okay, okay, got it. So that was something that was missing from the prototype. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and were there any specific elements that you think were missing from the interface, not, not necessarily just the prototype? I would have to take a look at it again. Oh. Yep, no, I, I've actually brought up the home screen. Yeah. Oh, so we're talking about the home screen now, right? Or just the, the entire experience. I thought it was very, uh, it was very easy. Okay, cool. Yeah. And there was nothing that stood out to you as missing? When I was taking it, yeah. I was, I was more thinking about like, how was I able to create the account? And how would I get to, you know, the front page? That's what I was thinking at first. Okay, great. Cool. Well, thanks so much. Did you have any other uh, general thoughts that you wanted to add? Hmm. Not currently. Yeah. Okay. Do Do you know anybody who we should who we should talk to who might also be interested in taking this study? Yes. Um, I have a few people that would love to to try uh, to take this usability test. Great. We'd love to get intros and we can offer them $20 Amazon gift cards. Perfect. So thanks so much for your time. This is really helpful in, in, uh, in helping us uh, create a more intuitive experience uh, so that next time you shop on this app, hopefully it'll be even a little bit smoother. So thanks Perfect. for your help. Appreciate your time and looking forward to, uh, to getting your feedback in the future. Okay, thank you. You have a good day. All right, thanks JP, you too. Bye -bye. I, I know someone that would love a twenty dollar Amazon gift. Card. All right, all right. I, <laughs> okay, so uh, so what did you guys think? Any any takeaways from this exercise? I mean, I saw that there was a lot of uh, follow up questions. Yeah, there were a lot of follow up questions for a pretty for a pretty simple task. So maybe some of it seemed a little bit redundant. But I do, did want to specifically pull out um, whether there was anything that was particularly easy, anything particularly difficult, anything that was missing, anything that was confusing. And there can be overlap, but sometimes asking similar questions in different ways can, uh, can trigger uh, different memories as well. Was there anything that, uh, that I didn't ask that you think might have been useful? Maybe asking how you felt about creating an account, maybe. Oh, okay, yeah, how did you feel about the experience in general, uh, yeah. ha having to create an account? Okay, that's a good idea, asking like a higher level question. Mm -hmm. um, how about maybe um, asking some of his other favorite like websites so that you could um, compare? Okay, cool, yeah, that, I think that, that would be a really good thing to talk about either in the warm up or uh, or ask about in the screener even like which which uh, what are your top three websites that you visit or something like that or even know what are the three main places that you go to buy clothes to understand their other experiences and I think for it's good to contextualize it and this this flow was this test was specifically because we wanted to test the sign up flow because it's one of the core product experiences. So for the test itself, we wanted to stick just to this to make sure that it was intuitive. So do you, do you feel like, uh, do you have any open, que any questions that you would want to have answered before completing this kind of usability test yourself? Before administering it yourself? All right. Well, we, we can follow up later if, you, if any questions do come up. So next, we're going to do another in-class challenge. So you're going to pretend that you just began working as UX designer for NPR, the, the news media company. So you want to conduct a baseline usability study on the shop portion of the site. So you're going to take the next 15 minutes and begin exploring the shop section of NPR. Then you're going to write down five tasks that you would have a user complete to better understand the usability of this section of the site. So 
try to think about uh, what some of the core or most important um, tasks are that a user could, could complete on this part of the site. Think about it from a business perspective uh, and then define those tasks. And let me share this link in Slack. And I'll open this up on my screen too. So we're in the shop section here. So just think about uh, three types of tasks that a user could complete, and that would uh, that would make sense for you to do your usability test on. And remember to keep keep it specific to completing a real world task rather than just asking them to say uh, shop the collection. Try to try try not to put the exact wording from the interface into your questions. Instead, focus on like uh, questions like, uh, where, would you, where would you go to buy an NPR t-shirt, for example. All right, uh, any questions before we start this assignment? As usual, I'll post a screenshot in Slack, and then I'll start the timer on my screen. By task, you mean like things like we were doing, like sign in, sign up? Exactly, go yeah. Go to a page. Or like, like that. buy an item. Um, is any any uh, like real world goal that the user could accomplish, whether that's si signing up an account or buying a t-shirt. Okay. Cool. Um, I will start my timer. And so we'll do 15 minutes for this. Oh, thanks Kyla for sharing that. Oh, sorry, didn't realize I was muted. I've been talking for like 10 minutes. Just kidding, I just started talking. But um, all right, cool. So let's take a look at the NPR shop uh, and would love to just go around and have some people tell us, uh, tell us some tasks that they came up with. I could go. All right, what you got? So uh, because this is a shopping um, website primarily. So the five questions I had was around their shopping experience. So um, I think I would like them to um, um, get to the item they wanted. Um, say, for example, in this case, the personalized, I think there's an Alexa. OK. <laughs> cool. So the task, so the, what is the task? Find oh, um, if they can add, if they can find the item they wanted, like if everything is in the correct uh, categories, like, like if they're looking for um, a book, for example, if it's in the right place. So okay. that would be the one test. Cool. So um, let, and let's uh, let's make that a, a specific. Uh, so the test should just be in the form of a specific request. So for this, it, it could be uh, what oh. you would ask the user to do would be uh, find the find the branded Alexa speaker. 
yeah yeah that okay. that was the one I got. so cool. the sounds good so we're scrolling we're scrolling okay there it is we found it okay That's so the then yep. um i would want for them to be able to um add to the cart um what they want i mean the the alexa if they could easily add it to the cart okay cool so the and whole shopping experience if they can add to the cart change their mind about it remove it or change quantities or change colors that sort of thing yep. and eventually when they get down to payment how that is going to be if they're able to apply coupons and that sort of thing so the task would check just their shopping experience like the okay. week, awesome think. yeah i think that makes sense because the the primary goal of this website is to get them to buy something right so yeah. and I, um I think the first task, find Alexa, I think that's a good first step, but we could probably be a little bit more general, make it a little more challenging for them. Because if we, if we break it down into chunks that are, that are a little too easy, then we're sort of walking them through the experience. So what oh. I suggest in there would be to keep a little bit broader and say maybe um, add Amazon Alexa speaker to your cart. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So make it a little more challenging for them. Mm -hmm. So they're going to find it and then they're going to add it to their cart. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the next task is, uh, okay, you change your mind and you actually want to remove this. Yeah. 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 So that would make sense. Cool. And then, um, and then, oh, let's continue shopping. We'll add it again. Mm -hmm. And then the next task you said was what? What to um, proceed to check out. Okay, cool. So we're going to add it to our cart. It's already there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so proceed to check out might be even also a little bit easy since there's a big checkout right. button right there and they'll already be on the step. So how do oh, you think you're, they you're ready to buy it? How yeah. Okay. So making it taking it one step further, let's ask them to actually buy it. Mm -hmm. So check out. Then they're going to go through this flow. Um, maybe mm -hmm. this is a prototype, so we populate it with dummy data so that they mm -hmm. can do that. And then if they successfully check out, then they've completed the task. Yeah. There was one I thought this site lacked was when you actually go to checkout, there is no way that you can buy something if you haven't made an account or something. Sometimes like if you're on a site, they let you quick pay without having an account. Yeah. So um, that uh, would be yeah. like, um, like if, if I was doing this test, that would be something that I would complain about. Yeah. That's what I'm... <laughs> Are, yeah, that's a, that's a good insight. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. So does, does everyone see how we want to make the, make the tasks broad enough that we ask them to do like a series of natural actions? Like we're asking them to do something sort of in real life. Like we want you to, we want you to add this to your cart or we want, where we want you to, um, or we want you to buy this rather than asking them something that's really specific to the interface. Like, we, like, um, we want you to find this or we want you to click on the continue button. Does that distinction make sense? Um, could you ask um, the user different to do different tasks or just one one task at a time? Oh, so uh, what uh, what's an example? So with the Alexa, you ask them to complain until checkout, um, and then can you go back and say, "Hey, let's let's do something else now"? Yeah, definitely. So it just depends. Sometimes the tasks are connected, like it makes sense to do them in order, like you add it to your cart and then you say, okay, now remove it from the cart. But you can also test unrelated tasks. So if, if what you're testing is the ability to check something out and then you wanna test um, the ability to maybe find a specific item, um, like maybe you want them to find ra a radio, um, and that could be another option. Maybe you wanna just test their ability to log in from this page. So you could you could test unrelated tasks, yes. Because I had like different, I didn't sort of complete one task. So I had um, where would you click to shop for a T-shirt, or oh. and then um, where would you go to find a new arrival? So I had like different things. Yeah, those those are fine too. Uh, that's sort of testing the information architecture of the site. Does it make sense to them how the navigation is set up? Like, are the items where they expect to find them? Cool. Does anybody else want to share a task that they came up with? 
maybe one you weren't sure about? Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. So I've got one that is, can you show me how you would find, select and order an umbrella within this shop? Oh, okay, cool. I think that, that's a good question. So that's kind of a long flow. We're asking them to do a few different things there. Um, so maybe, you know, maybe the, the first two parts are sort of implicit. Maybe you could just even say, can you show us, can you show me how you would, how you would order an umbrella? And the, the find and select are just sort of implied. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see what, how would we find an umbrella? Uh, ooh, it sounds like maybe an accessory. Uh, nope, I don't see it there. Now I'm just checking all of these. So I don't see anything that says umbrella. So I'm actually just going to search at this point. There's an umbrella. I'm going to add it to my cart and then I'll check it out. Yeah, so that's that would be a good test. And look and ask the user to really speak out loud like I just did and explain uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I didn't see it in any of these categories, so I'm just going to search it. Anyone else? Uh, I had one that was like, if you wanted to browse all the items, like where would you click for that? Cool. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know where I would click. Is there an option for that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't find it either. <laughs> oh, okay, so maybe that's not an option. So this is, that's kind of an example of how you want to make sure that the prototype that you're using actually so, fits all the tasks in the script. Yeah, I guess, so like my own answer to that question would have been, like I probably would have gone through the different categories one by one. Like maybe I would have started with sale and then been like, oh, now I want to look at clothing. And then I would have gone and like looked at all the clothing, like that sort of deal. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's sort of a test of like, okay, if there's not an option for someone to like, do that specific thing, like how would they work around it? I right, guess. right. Yeah, and I think, um, so I think in the way it was phrased, uh, show me how you browse all the items, it sort of made me think there must be some place that I can do that. So maybe mm -hmm. applying it more to the, just also because browse just sounds like it's specific to the interface, maybe yeah. a little bit broader and say, or a little more contextualized actually and saying like, so you get to the site and you want to buy somebody an NPR present, but you don't really know what. Uh, where where would where would you look to what what where would you search to see uh, or no, what would your process be if you're just kind of looking for any NPR item? Yeah, that's not super well put, but but yeah, I get uh, the idea. Yeah, <laughs> I get the idea. Or like, what would your search process be? Yeah, but, or like, where would where would be the first place that you gravitated to look or something of that nature? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Anybody else? All right. Do you, do you feel prepared to come up with some of your own tasks for today's assignment? Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. yeah. Can we do one more, actually? Yeah, sure. Is that, who else has a task? Uh, we can do mine. Okay, cool. Uh, I was wondering if you can show me how to follow NPR um, to stay connected with oh, them. Oh, cool, cool. Uh, so I'll be your tester here. So my first instinct is to look down at the footer. So sign up for a newsletter. And so I would enter my email there. What about Facebook? Facebook? Uh, I see there's a Facebook link here. So I would click that and then I would follow it on Facebook. Perfect. Yeah, that was pretty easy. That's a good question. Yeah, so if one of if one of the main goals of this part of the website is to get people to sign up for the newsletter, then that could be a good task. For the test. Okay, perfect. Okay, cool. So I wanted to leave a few minutes to go over the assignment. And uh, as we, we got some requests, I'm also going to go over the rubric together in class. And then if you, we have a few minutes after that, I can definitely take a, another task or two on the shop. Uh, okay, so taking a look at the assignment. So you're going to, we're going to be using Newsy 
as the example today. And you're going to start out by thinking about the Newsy platform and what are two tasks that you would want to test. And when it says measure metrics, uh, we're talking about uh, success or fail, like what percentage of users were able to, to accomplish this task. And then you're going to go to this usability script that we looked through together. Uh, you can use most of it as it is, but you want to just change uh, the parts that are, that are going to be relevant to your study. And then you're going to add your two tasks here, where it says task completion, as well as uh, two or three follow-up questions per task. So think about uh, the example that I did with JP, where I was asking him like, what parts of this were easy, what parts were confusing, or make them more specific to the actual tasks at hand, like what did you expect to happen when you clicked on this, or what did you, what did you expect when you clicked on that? And so once you've defined your two tasks and updated the interview guide template, then you're going to uh, create an actual prototype that fulfills the requirements of your user test. So this can just be a wireframe, uh, it should be low fidelity. Uh, just create a few screens and link them up in InVision or whatever tool you prefer to use uh, so that the user is able to complete the full tasks that you're testing. So kind of like, kind of like what we made here. And you can use Sketch, or you can use, uh, oh man, what was the name of the one that we used for this? Does anyone remember this? Maybe one of the TLs? It looks like Whimsical. Whimsical, yes, thank you. Whimsical uh, is a really good tool for prototyping. I'll share that in Slack. Sorry, it's a really good tool for prototyping or wireframes. So it's really good for creating wireframes, thank you. And then you can easily upload those wireframes into InVision. And they look really nice. And then you're actually going to conduct the usability test on at least two other students, friends, or family members. And so make sure that what you're doing is, is you actually take the time to read through this entire script. So you so you're setting the background and you're getting a feeling for what it's like to actually moderate a usability test. And then as a stretch goal, uh, after each one, write down a couple of paragraphs um, about, uh, about what you found interesting or what you might want to review later from each test. Any questions on this? Um, can we like edit uh, or add to previous wireframes we've created for Newsy? Um, yeah, for the that's fine for today, yeah. Okay. Uh, just make sure that, that the, oh, the, the two tasks are able to be completed in their entirety in the prototype. Cool. Is, that, is everything else pretty clear? Anyone have questions about what tools you want to use for this? Or any suggestions? Uh, what do you mean by um, two to three follow-up questions per task? Sure, so say one of your tasks is create an account, yeah. uh, like I did with JP, then your follow-up questions would be uh, related to that exercise. So like, what was easy, maybe what was confusing, or um, how confident were you that you completed the task? Uh, do you have do you have any suggestions for how this uh, how this could be made simpler? So those are really up to you based on based on the type of task. I have a question. I'm not sure if it was asked earlier, but um, is there a reason why you chose a seven as your scaling? Um, oh. Um, Seven is, is just a pretty common scale, five or seven is just a pretty common scale to use uh, because, um, because it's odd. So you can have one in the middle that's neutral and then you can, you can get a scale on either side. Um, oh, oh, it's like I, strongly disagree to strongly agree. Exactly, yeah. Oh. Um, and the, that's actually even more granular than that because strongly to agree to strongly agree is actually, that's fine. five. Uh, so seven is even a little more granular. I, honestly, I, I didn't pick that scale. I, don't, I couldn't speak too much to why uh, that was chosen. That was actually Glenn, uh, but he, he would be a good person to ask. Cool. cool. And then one thing I don't know if I emphasized was make sure to record your test. 
So I recommend doing a Zoom call or, um, or if, you, uh, if you just do a phone call. Ooh, it's best to use a video platform so that they can share their screen so you can get the audio and the video, but also make sure that you have a backup method like a, like a phone call and, uh, and a way to record it. But does everybody have access to Zoom with screen recording? OK, great. Yeah, that's definitely the best bet. Cool. Uh, so let's take a look at, at the rubric. So first, uh, the first part is the usability guide. So this is the usability guide here. And I will, uh, I'll post a link to this so that you can just make a copy and then, and then edit it for yours. And so a one on this would be students work did, actually I'll start with the three. A three student creates a guide with additional or more in-depth tasks with both main and ancillary questions. So uh, tasks with, uh, with more than two follow-up questions, basically. A two would be with uh, two tasks based on the Newsy project with two follow-up questions per task. And then a one is just that you did not uh, do, you did not at a minimum uh, create level two. Then for the prototype, uh, a two, I'm actually going to start with the two, would be uh, you incorporate all the tasks from the usability guide. A one would be uh, the, it did not reach level two of the objective, so it doesn't incorporate all the tasks from the usability guide. And a three would, you be, would be you really create a cohesive low fidelity prototype that looks and feels and behaves like a real product. So for example, clicking on the logo takes the user to the home page. And maybe there, so maybe there are some interactions in there that aren't necessarily part of just the tasks. So there are some alternate routes that the user could take. And then also um, for the actual testing, uh, you conduct at least two usability interviews using the questions in the usability guide. And uh, the TLs are able to, to check your recording and make sure that you are effectively interacting with the user. And then a three would be that you conduct more than two effective usability interviews. Actually, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to update this, actually. Sorry, that, that was in the assignment, but it wasn't incorporated here. So for a three, either conduct more than two usability interviews and or, and or write two or three paragraphs with findings from each test as a stretch. Any questions about the rubric or assignment? TLs, everything clear to you? Yep, all good. Awesome, so we're at 11 on the dot. Uh, everybody have a great lunch, uh, and uh, and you'll be with Brandon for the rest of the week. And I will see you all uh, for Build Week next week. Um, but have have a great end of your week, and uh, and I will see you on Monday. Bye. Thanks for uh, thanks for all your contributions, too. This was a really awesome couple of days, and I really appreciate everyone who stepped up and volunteered and kept the conversations going. So um, I'll see you guys all on Monday. Bye. Bye.